Number six, Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are in the home stretch. We only need six more members to achieve this goal for $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait, you can help keep Fishing the DMV alive and well. All Patreon members will receive 5% off off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 10% off all of your orders to Tiger Crankbaits, access to our private Facebook group community, live streams just for our members, contest giveaways, weekly memberships, and so much more. For more information, check the link in the episode description. This has been a long, hard journey, and we've actually, we did it, guys. We're so close to getting this done. Six more. That's all we need. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Once once or twice. How is everybody doing today on the final edition from this fantastic Augusta County Fishing Expo here? Uh, It's so funny how people are all connected and down here, we have somebody talk about an issue that's really near and dear to this whole show, which is the Shenandoah River and some of the pollution problems, issues, and concerns that have happened in the past. This is something that we've all covered from, we had Travis Eden, I think it was like the first episode we did like three years ago, to we had you know Mr. Wandorf, Mark Wandorf. Frondorf. Rondorf, thank you again, guys, I have an impediment or whatever. And then Shelby again, Shelby and Odenkirk, we had a special guest there, because Shelby was really one of the guys, like really was there with like the lawsuits and stuff, if I'm not mm, mistaken. Jeff Shelby, yeah. Uh, and now we have another individual on to kind of talk about this. And then guys, if you can scoot just a little bit closer, because I apologize, it's not as wide of a camera. There we go, that's that guy, you just got a full screen. So um, yeah, sir, if you could just tell us uh, who you are and kind of what's going on. I'm Tommy Lawhorn with uh, South River Fly Shop in Waynesboro. Um, we do a lot of uh, smallmouth guiding on the Shenandoah, trout fishing throughout the national park and national forest around the area. And when you consider like the Shenandoah, like you said, the national parks, when I think <clears throat> the Shenandoah, you know, I think a lot of people think from like Riverton all the <clears throat> way till it hits West Virginia. And I think that's just because of the Northern Virginia people, that's what they see. But when you mean the Shenandoah, what portion? So we're on the headwaters of the Shenandoah, the South Fork of the Shenandoah River. And the South Fork is made up of the three rivers that begin here in Augusta County. That's the South River, the North River, and the Middle River. Mm -hmm. And all three of those rivers actually begin here in Augusta County, Virginia. So we are where those rivers come together at Port Republic, um, which is just slightly north of the town of Grottos. And that's where the Shenandoah, South Fork of the Shenandoah properly begins, is where the South meets the middle and North. Um, So we're floating different stretches from there down to Luray. Um, We typically don't go any further than Luray because that gets to be more than an hour's drive for our guides each way. And when you say Luray, are you thinking Egypt Bend or is there other? 211 uh, Bridge. 211 Bridge. The uh, the boat landing there. House. Okay. That's usually our last takeout is right there at 211. So we're above Egypt Bend. Mm -hmm. Um, We do a lot of float trips, so we don't do any motorized boats. Mm -hmm. Um, We're we're rafting uh, and fly fishing and spin fishing, conventional tackle for smallmouth down there. To explain the obvious, Thomas, to your point too, I think it's fascinating to say that the what the waters you just explained, that that water, Mm -hmm. that specific water is moving north and it's going is going to end up in all these towns to from yeah. Luray and then hit you know your, Front your Royal Mount and Jackson and your Woodstock takes, and right? yeah Give two hours so yeah. we drove two hours down eighty one and we're still talking the Shenandoah yes River. and that same and, river yeah, water cool. starting here is going to eventually end up in our backyard and then to your point you know mm. come together north and the south the main you know to the Potomac at Harpers yes. Ferry that's going to dump in so we're talking about the same. The same water. Yes. And it's, we, are we don't the, think about that sometimes. We don't. The, the South River here in Waynesboro, Middle River, North River, are the southernmost, easternmost tributaries of the Potomac. Wow. Wow. Wow, I didn't That's think of cool. it that way. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, you know, there's all these branches of the Potomac over in West Virginia, mm-hmm. the middle, you know, the... North North Fork of the South Branch and the South Branch of the Fork. Yeah, there's yeah, all these right. pieces of the Potomac over in West Virginia, but the South River here, the Middle River here, Christians Creek that's right over the ridge from where we're sitting right now, 
those are all tributaries of the Potomac at the end of the day. Hmm. Wow, that's crazy. So I know I was like guys, and so I'm I'm str I'm going back to back trying to like get guests on the show and stuff, and then I hear these two having a conversation off air um, about some of the issues that we've discussed a couple times on the show. So I don't even know where to begin with it because you guys have been, so like where would yeah, be a good so, place to start? You know, I think it's interesting the connections uh, when you think about. I was talking about the hatchery and the lawsuit that was that was uh, recently awarded. Um, you know, when we talked to Halliker and the the hatchery in Front Royal. The, the percentage of the money of that entire lawsuit. And I asked him, you know, is that that mercury spill that we heard about? Because again, you hear mm -hmm. it, I don't, I didn't yep. put a connection or a dot to where it was on a map, uh, but is that the same uh, water that we're talking about? And you yes. said it was right here in Waynesboro. So the DuPont plant on the banks of the South River in downtown Waynesboro back in the 1930s and 40s used mercury in their processes. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, nobody knew anything about no one did. No. pollution right. back in those right. days. We Great can't point. throw the blame good for something that nobody that everybody was doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and they were just dumping the mercury out. And mm -hmm. it got into the system. It got into the floodplain. It got into the the bottom of the river um, and contaminated the food chain because it methylized in the bottom of the river. Um, there's some amazing science that DuPont paid for mm. um, before this $50 million settlement. Wow. Um, there's world-renowned science based off of the mercury spill from the DuPont plant in the 1930s and 40s mm. in Waynesboro, Virginia. That's crazy. And that same DuPont plant is where Lycra was invented. Really? Damn. Lycra fiber that's in everything we do these days was invented there at that plant. Hmm. It just cost us the river. <laughs> and so, you know, there's a, there was a made, there's some, you know, it's some, it was a major benefit to the world, hmm. um, what they were doing there, hmm. but there was a cost. That $50 million settlement was the Fish and Wildlife Service damages to natural resources settlement. That wasn't the EPA settlement. That's still ongoing. Mm. Um, that wasn't the cleanup and, and the damage control. That was just the money for damages to natural resources and fishermen and hunters and bird watchers and all that because everything that's touching that mercury mm -hmm. from the smallest, you know, micro mm -hmm. bugs in the river up through the birds, the fish, the frogs, the turtles, the snails, the snakes, everything in that system is contaminated with some level of mercury. But did, wasn't there, and just for people that don't know, wasn't there a settlement just to make sure like everything got fixed and everything sunshine and hasn't, rainbows? There's not a truly, I mean, it's kind of like super funds. There's never truly a settlement there. There's ongoing work. There's still ongoing work. They're trying to encapsulate mercury in the banks that haven't eroded where mercury's out in the floodplain in the soil where it's fairly inert. It's still raw mercury at that point. It's not methylated. It's not easily absorbable. Mm -hmm. They're doing, they're still doing work on that. They're encapsulating these banks and keeping that soil with mercury in it from getting into the bottom of the river and methylating. That could be ongoing for the next, God knows how long. I mean, it, it could keep going. And at that point too, the, the lawsuit, the 50 million, when did that start? When did that lawsuit come to fruition if it just now is settled for that particular one how long did that take <laughs> that actually began in the 90s in the 90s wow and the south river science so team over 30 years the south river science team was funded by dupont um and they hired and they hired like samplers okay to do these regular samplings. And these are professional organizations that do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, AECOM is one that I know mm -hmm. that did a lot of sampling in the river. Um, but they paid for grants for scientists mm -hmm. to come and study what it did to the birds, what it did to right. frogs, what it did to fish, right. what it did to turtles. And actually smallmouth bass were the indicator species that was chosen. Really? Because at, in the late eighties, there weren't trout in the oh. South River in town wow. where the mercury had gone in. The trout program on the South River started in 1989. Interesting. And it was started as a delayed harvest because the smallmouth had recovered, 
In the 70s, there were no fish in downtown Waynesboro. To that point, which fish species, I know some fish species are, are more susceptible to water quality issues. Mm -hmm. Would trout, walleye, catfish, small, which one would be affected first? Which one would be the canary in the coal mine, so to speak, to something like that? Typically speaking, you would say trout there. But smallmouth are pretty sensitive. Mm. Um, so it's it's a pretty mm. close race there between the trout and the smallmouth. They both need pretty clean water um, to thrive. Okay. Now, trout need colder water than smallmouth. And so with the South River flowing through town, being channelized from flooding over the years to manage flood control and all that, the South in a lot of places was overwidened had open banks, no shade, had good springs flowing into it, but it got pretty warm. There was a dam in town that <laughs> heated it up. Um, mm. So the South actually was a better smallmouth fishery prior to 2011 when that dam came out than a trout fishery because it was clean water quality wise. There was mercury mm. in the bottom of the river, but the, the water quality was good other than that. Gotcha. It was clean and clear. It was a nice stream even at that point. But in 2011, that dam came out that was really superheating mm. a large portion of the river. Let's talk about that. So the dam, was this just, what, what was the purpose of the dam before it got taken out? So the dam was the Rife Loth Dam. Um, and hmm. the Rife Stove Factory had a foundry there. Really? Early 1900s. The dam Ooh, was man, built around crazy. 1905. Wow. Damn. And there was a foundry there. Um, they. And that foundry eventually became Virginia Metal Crafters. So foundry would be like like metal smelting. Metal or smelting. Damn. And there was a it was a mill dam basically. Okay. Um, it was a power dam. They used it to generate water flow to power a mill. Okay. That powered a facility. For for context, like when you back a river up, so like Riverton, it's probably deepest point of the dam. There is like twenty to thirty. Man, no, probably about twenty feet, maybe right, fifteen to twenty feet at Riverton. Mm -hmm. So. Are we talking a dam of that size when you're backing up the river or is it a little bit smaller? So this dam was about 14, 15 feet tall. Okay. And it backed the South River up, which is only a 40 foot wide river, 30, 40 foot wide river. It backed the South River up for just over a mile. Okay, wow. Okay, good context. So there. you had flat water, yeah. not moving very fast for over a mile. Wow. It was a top flow dam. Hmm. The lower flows that were used for the mill race had long been clogged up. So the only water coming over that dam was the warmest water. That's right, yeah, I didn't think of that cool, yeah. Uh, in the summertime. And so our mm. downstream temperatures in the summer did not fluctuate day I'm to night. I am so glad you hit on that because I, we've had so many people on this show and one thing talking about is like Jackson, uh, Jackson River, because that gets pulled right out of Moomaw, well, that's not the top layer. That's the lower level, and that keeps the water cool. I never even thought like where the mm. water gets pulled from from a dam, how that will affect everything mm. downstream. That's wow. So we went <laughs> from water temperatures that did not fluctuate overnight on a hot day. You know, you had a hot, hot two weeks in the middle of the summer, and you're getting 80 degree water coming over the top of the dam. Then shortly, maybe a half a mile below the dam, there's a big spring that comes in. We would see the water on one side of the river be 74 degrees, day and night. We'd see water on the other side of the river be 58, 62, wow. 64. That's, that's wow. insane. It's just such a little thing, just a little yeah. thing like that. Just don't think about it. Once no. the dam came out, we actually started seeing a nocturnal variation because we killed that dam pool. We got rid of it. There's flowing water through that whole mile mm -hmm. now. It doesn't heat up as much. Mm -hmm. It doesn't absorb that heat as much. Mm -hmm. It's moving so, faster. Yeah. We now see that temperature get up to 73, 74, maybe 75 during a really bad spell in the afternoon. But by the next morning, it's back down into the high 60s or even mid 60s. <sighs> so, and so your trout yeah. that are colder water species, mm -hmm. they have a refuge from the heat. So they get stressed in the afternoon. They don't like it. 72, 74 degrees. That's a little hot for trout but it only lasts six, eight hours, and then it starts to cool back down. And by morning, they're feeding again. Mm -hmm. well, then by 10 or 11 o'clock, it's starting to warm up. They get sluggish again. They go hide. They go settle in the deeper holes and mm. cooler spring mouths, stuff like that. Yeah, but 
Now you were that's talking about what made it a year-round fishery. You were talking about shade down. earlier. You're talking about lack of shade, but has has there been trees introduced too? There has that will been. also help keep temperature down if you can shade the banks and things of that nature. Absolutely. So <clears throat> there's a tremendous amount more tree cover along gotcha. the river now than there was in 1990. Right. Cool. Um, there's there were hundreds of yards long stretches that had zero growth on them mm -hmm. on the banks why part of that was the old dupont mentality before they sold the plant in 2013 was keep it looking neat keep it looking clean we're mm -hmm. professionals they kept the banks clean mm -hmm. the entire bank along a three quarters of a mile river was kept clean mm -hmm. in 2013 when they moved out and sold the lycra business the new owners said we're not going to spend all that money <laughs> right. keeping the banks clean they let it grow up so now we've got 25 30 foot tall trees on those banks which is a good thing for the ecosystem yeah. yes. yes and that whole area now is well shaded <laughs> that used to be wide open to the sun and it was morning sun morning to midday sun so what i'm hearing too is business money dollars uh production versus ecosystem habitat mm -hmm. fisheries natural resource and it's it's where we can come together yep. yeah you know to maybe be able to still do both but you know making sure we're considering the yeah. entire entire picture well, they're still so. manufacturing lycra there it's mm -hmm. a different company that owns mm -hmm. lycra now but they're still manufacturing lycra there mm -hmm. um and you know they're it's a more environmentally aware system of course with the laws that are on the books yeah. and everything now it has to be but mm -hmm. uh, but we have seen the south river naturalize itself back to what it should have been in a lot of cases That's there's cool. still some over widening there was still some channelization that we can't fix easily and we don't want to dig around and disturb a bunch of that mercury either right um, when, when we talk about the settlement or not the settlement but the the, the money that was given to fix this stuff has it been used effectively to this point to help like w ground zero i don't think ground zero has gotten nearly the attention that it deserved and the the trout side of the south river has gotten zero dollars why um some of that's political i mean it was you know there was an old facility in front royal that was pretty defunct mm -hmm. They didn't have the money to fix it otherwise. We're talking about the smallmouth, the fish yeah. hatchery program? Mm -hmm. And there was an opportunity. We were in the middle of all the smallmouth kills. There was a lot of there was a lot of press about the fish kills on the Shenandoah from pollution, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, whatever pollutant was causing that. Um, that was really in the headlines when all this was coming about. And so let's do something about the smallmouth. It's connected. You know, that that mercury is all the way to the to Front Royal. Yeah. That same mercury has traveled down the river all the way to Front Royal. It's connected, it's in the system. So, and this is what the headline is right now. You know, smallmouth was the headline throughout a lot of that time frame. Mm. Trout wasn't the headline. You know, there weren't news stories being yeah. talked about about trout. And so that mm. was where the money went was to, hey, we've got this big problem with smallmouth. What can we do? Let's build a hatchery. Let's supplement the smallmouth population. Is that the most effective use of those dollars? There's a lot of us that think that it's not. Why? The smallmouth population in just one of these little tributaries alone will outproduce that hatchery. A healthy population in one tributary to the south or the Shenandoah will outproduce that hatchery. Smallmouth aren't easy to grow in a hatchery. Correct. Um, it's a very complex system. More complex than a trout hatchery. Trout are actually easier. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot more research been put into trout hatcheries because trout hatcheries have been around mm -hmm. a lot longer. There's a lot more of them. So trout are easier. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, at the end of the day, we can, everybody's going to have their opinion on that. Right. Will trout naturally <clears throat> reproduce? We've had trout reproduce in the South River. It's not a consistent thing, um, but we have found wild rainbow trout in town in the South River that were born in the river. Um, we haven't found it consistently, but since 2014, mm -hmm. 
about two years after the dam came out, two and a half, we actually started finding some wild rainbows here and there. And every year we find a few here and there. And that still is a challenge. I mean, I know you've talked about, we've talked about, you know, and the state does have a lot of data points, but then you think about licensing fees. And when you think, and we talk about the, you know, a trout fisherman versus the smallmouth angler, you now they're doing walleye, stocking a lot of walleye. Then now we're seeing a lot with the muskie. Mm -hmm. And so it's hard to, I can imagine, I, I would love to see a breakdown statistically of the of angler, yeah. trout. And that's one thing, first thing we saw yeah. when we came into this area is we noticed like this is a dominant trout area as opposed to we're more small mouth oriented than your, you know, your lakes large mouth. So that is a, and, I could see the struggle there. And these are is my, it proportional. And these are my favorite conversation because it's such a multi, it's not simple. It's very complex right. where trout, because of a stamp, you can replenish your trout right. stocking program. You don't have that for the small mouth. Mm -hmm. And it, as we've talked about in the show, there are three states in the United States of America that actually successfully reproduce small mouth bass. Maryland, Virginia, and South Carolina. I don't know how the hell South Carolina's in there, but they are. Maryland just shut down theirs. So now there's only Did two. they really? Yep. They they are claiming it's a success. I have the guy actually booked for March to come on the show. They're claiming it's a success. Yeah, I, I raised hell at the meeting because I'm on the board now talking about that. And they're like, we raised 96,000. We got the levels back up. We're shutting it down. And, and my point was, it's a good success, but you're, you're getting good data every time you do this. You're researching, you're right. going to do this. And the biggest thing they were harping on before this conversation was the Alabama bass situation. Right. And they're saying like, we're worried about Alabama bass killing off our smallmouth, but then by the way, we're gonna shut down the program. So it's right. like, is it money? Is that what it is? Which it's fine if that is, but let's yes. just call let's it what it is. Let's be and honest. And I think, and to that yeah. point too, you've done some really great things having the, the shop there on the South River. And then you talked about being able to take 300 signatures, mm -hmm. I think it was. 600. 600, 600, 600, 600 you know, and so, to be that voice because I think I think sometimes too we can be complacent and yeah. it's just status quo or we don't we just want to go fish. We don't want to yeah. we don't want to have to do the legwork, go to the meetings and do all this stuff. But I think sometimes that the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean that is the other sad part about it. But and to add to it there with the trout situation, I know for Maryland and Virginia, the number one thing that's that's that they raise is still trout for both states. Hard, they, they mm -hmm. have no problem raising trout. They have trout right. in the bank somewhere. So my thought would be this, it's not like, why are you putting funds towards a small mouth instead of putting it to more trout? It's like, why aren't we getting some of the trout that you already have? It's not like, it's not hard to find some trout to help supplemental. So that to me is like, what's yeah. going on there with the paperwork? So well, to speak? and we have an issue here and it's, it's a long-term issue. It's in other states as well. You may have seen some in the news about the West Virginia governor, governor yes. throwing a fit about the the feds saying you can't federal stock these funding, streams yeah. anymore or we'll take your federal funding. And that was due to endangered species, understand, like a, a darter a and darter then a couple crayfish. Yeah. But, oh, Jesus yeah. Sorry. But, Sorry, guys. So, so here's the thing. We're stocking trout mm -hmm. streams in Virginia mm -hmm. that have native brook trout populations in them. Self-sustaining native brook trout populations. Mm. Why are we doing that? Why are we putting that extra stocking truck Correct. follower pressure on those streams? And why are we introducing the chance at diseases and viruses? That's actually a valid point into about Into those that. streams. Yeah. And I want to ask yeah. a quick question If we too. need more trout somewhere, why don't we take the ones that are being put well, in those places it, it, and put them in the places that exactly. are getting more pressure? So I want to ask that question now is because you're very educated and very knowledgeable and you're, you're a native, sounds like, like you're, you're, you know your area. What would be your request then, like, as far as what, what is needed for the South River and the tributaries leading into that? What, if you could, like he always said, yeah. if you had the million dollars and you could fix it, how, what would you do or what is needed? With the <clears throat> easy access of the South River from the eastern part of the state, mm -hmm. we are, the South River through downtown Waynesboro is less than two miles off of I-64. With the ease of access for anglers from Richmond, from Williamsburg, mm -hmm. from Tidewater, from that whole Piedmont region who want to trout fish, mm -hmm. we have an opportunity and, and we've capitalized on that opportunity to a great degree, but it could be even better to have miles of a decent sized river, mm -hmm. weightable, not, don't need a boat to fish it, 
a weightable, decent sized river that in certain areas, not the whole thing, but certain areas can hold trout year round. Mm. It could be the premier and it does need stocking. There's not enough natural reproduction. There's There are occasionally native brook trout that come down out of a mountain stream and find a spring and sit there but there's not a native trout population there anymore. Maybe there was 300 years ago, but it's not anymore. It needs stocking to maintain it. We could put that resource to where more people have access to it. Hmm. We could put those trout that five guys are going, but the day they see it on the stocking report to Falls Hollow, which is a tiny little brook trout stream, and the same five guys go and fish it every time it gets stocked and catch the fish out of it. That's a waste of that resource. Mm -hmm. That's that's not someone that bought a trout stamp in Richmond is ever going to see that stream. Fair enough, yeah. That's, that's not something that any, you know, the majority yeah. of trout anglers are ever going to see. And are you speaking specifically South River? Is that what you're that's Well, for the, the for the South water. River, but you've also got the Jackson River that has right. a lot of opportunity Which is on well it. Well known. I mean, you got the Smith River down in 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 uh, the Martinsville area that has a lot of cold water that can carry trout year round and it has a good wild brown trout population but the rainbows are supplemented there we could supplement it more huh. um you know so there's opportunities for these easier to reach mm. places <clears throat> and it takes the pressure off of these the little other, brook trout streams yeah. that are brook trout are our state fish mm -hmm. Interesting. They're, they're our only native trout mm. to the eastern seaboard. <clears throat> um, and they're stuck in these little mountain tributaries because of their needs. They need super clean, super cold water. You know, they can't... Here in Virginia, you don't see brook trout below about 1,200 feet elevation. Hmm. We just don't have cold enough water below that elevation. Right. Um, so there's a band on the mountains that these brook trout live in. Why are we putting stock trout to compete with them in those in that band? Now, if they're not there and you're stocking a stream, okay. Right, right. No big deal. I see your point. But if there's a self-sustaining population of those native brook trout, see if I can. No, you're fine. Uh, of those native brook trout in a stream, like I used Falls Hollow as an example. I mean, Falls Hollow is as wide as this table. And it's getting hatchery trout. Yeah, so I think what I'm hearing too, and this is just my thought, is it's it's about how they're already allocating the resources they have within the trout sector, and and how they're using that money. Because it seems like it's not where's the money going, and how is it allocated? Doesn't doesn't make any sense? Because mm -hmm. um, at least you know, and again, I'm going to get the Maryland guys on here soon to talk to them. At least they're saying we got the smallmouth back to where they were before the big kill, mm -hmm. and we're done. At least that makes some logical sense. And so for the Shenandoah thing, I get like with the smallmouth, get it back in different levels you want before the big fish kills. That's fine. Mm -hmm. From the trout perspective, it sounds like, well, making, building, a, having trout isn't the problem here. We have a ton of them. It's how they're allocated all across mm -hmm. the, the, the state. And it seems like that is the issue, honestly, is why, why are they put here, not here? Well, and there was, mm -hmm. uh, and there's hatchery issues that arise from time to time with trout. There are times when there are shortages because wasn't there a trout kill we talked about with There's, Halliker? Yeah, yeah there, they, they had lost a, they, a bunch yeah. of fish yeah. in one of the hatcheries this year. Um, so there is a little shortage this year. Um, but it's a perfect time to talk about how we're mm. allocating those fish. If we're doing three stockings at Falls Hollow, of even if it's only 150 trout per stocking, that's another stocking on Poor Farm. That's another stocking on the South River. Mm. you know that you're giving up right. to put them there it's, it's it is still fascinating to me because like you've brought it up to the trout stamp um or if like i'm a small game hunter or deer hunter but i mean they do those are grouped together but it's and we're all fishing we're buying a fishing license but you have a national forest stamp you have a trout stamp like i would love to see the data and the, the analytics statistics there. on that and what is it proportional yeah um and i know it's hard this is a hard thing i keep looking at thomas's map there and when you're seeing that south fork and how it stretches all the way down almost to the mari and then the cow pasture jackson or the smith down in the bottom corner like to your point like that there's a lot of water it's a lot, a of, lot of miles of water and it's that's a daunting task i but, can take you to the ridge top 
they're 25 minutes from here where one side of the ridge goes to the Mari and the James and the other side of the ridge comes to Waynesboro in the heard south. Of that. That's big levels. Yeah. It's part of the national forest just south of here. Okay. It's about 20 minutes from here. Wow. So I just got a message from my friend. Hey boss, listening live, you're doing great. Um, he doesn't know how to use YouTube comment section. My thought is this, if you raise a small mouth, 90% of the anglers out there are going to put that thing back in the water versus a trout that's a put and take. So which one is actually a better return on investment? That, huh. Um, but I think we're taught, that is interesting. Because if, it, if it's more or less with trout though, there is that thing about your you're going to catch and take home. So I guess it's also how you break that down too, between the, the put and takes versus you're just trying to make sure that you always have a so healthy. So a few years ago, I actually have some answers to that. A few years ago, there was the stock trout management plan update for the state of Virginia. And DWR actually did phone surveys, in-person surveys of trout stamp buyers. Okay. And around, I'm, I'm going off the top of my head on this a little bit, but they broke it down by never keep any trout, mm. but are a trout fisherman, always keep trout. And then in between there was sometimes and rarely on both sides of that. It was sometimes I'll keep a trout, rarely keep a trout. And then sometimes I don't keep trout. You know, it was, it was six layers, or six legs of that graph. The two legs on either end were almost even. Mm. Damn. It was a slightly lower on the catch and release end than on the catch and keep always end. Maybe 41 to 38. Hmm. That's what I'm remembering off the top of my head was like 41% of the people that bought a trout stamp go to catch fish to eat. Interesting. Take them home. 38 or so percent go to catch fish purely for recreation. And then everybody else fell in between. Well, if you take 38 and 41, that's pretty close to 70. So only 30% were in that middle. Hmm. Interesting. And of that 30%, about half of them were rarely, and about half of them were usually. That's a good thing to bring up next and time we get some guys on. I want to talk about that. That was actually a DWR survey of trout stamp buyers. Now, that's a little bit aged data. That's over five years old. <laughs> but... I would say from being in a fly shop, a stone's throw literally from a catch and release area that we see more and more people, both conventional and fly using that area every year. I have conventional anglers who stop in the fly shop to donate money to the stocking fund that we do the supplemental stocking out of. Oh, talk about they that a little bit. They don't buy yeah. anything from uh, me. They're yeah. not my yes. customer. They, I don't have anything for them. Let me, let me, I want to throw this out too, because I, I love these conversations mm -hmm. too. I know, Tom, it's, and what you're saying is too, we're looking at, okay, the state where there's resources. Okay. But then what you just said, I think is fascinating because I think about it this way too. What, how does that supplemental work? So the supplemental stocking started in 2012. Our Trout Unlimited chapter went to DWR and said, hey, a lot more people are using this, this delayed harvest at that point. Uh, a lot more people are using this. Can we get some more fish? Well, we don't have any more to allocate. They're already allocated elsewhere. Well, can we buy some fish to supplement it? Well, yeah, we can do that. We can give you a stocking permit and we can work with you on that, but you'll have to come up with the money. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And that Love program it. has grown. Love it. Love it. it started out with just a $500 tourism grant and $500 from our fly shop. We bought the first load of fish. Um, you know, we donated 500 and this tourism department donated 500. How did we you bought get the them first involved? Loads. The They're tourism department. Three doors down from us. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and 12 years later, you're still doing it. And, and that's brilliant. 12 that's years brilliant. later, we're stocking nearly $5,000 worth of fish a year. Love it. And, and this is something that we've hit on too, because as you guys know, <laughs> with Fishing the DMV, you know, we're going to be starting a nonprofit in the next couple of years to do supplemental stocking because that's like how the, the F1s got into the James River, Smith Mountain Lake, and Kerr mm -hmm. is it wasn't the government. It was a private group that said, like, let's mm -hmm. just do this thing. And, mm -hmm. and as much. As much as I want the state to get everything right, it's going to have to come down to if you live in a local region, get a nonprofit mm -hmm. together, get get a, your group together, your club and work with the state. Say, like, we'll just do it ourselves because mm -hmm. that's honestly the quickest way to finding mm -hmm. a correction to the problem. Sadly, it is. Yeah. Uh, and and no fault to the guys that are out there on the ground doing yeah. the work yeah. for, right. no. for DWR. Mm -hmm. To some degree, their hands are tied. Correct. It's government. I mean, it's, you know, yeah. and so no fault to them at all. This is a way that 
us as anglers yes. mm-hmm. can step up and say, let's make this better. Correct. We got William Barnes. Uh, we have similar problems uh, as in Pennsylvania, where historically the focus of PA Fish and Boat Commission has been trout with warm species as an afterthought. Really think it has to do with the stamp. I think the stamp is a very interesting thing I'm going to talk to more people about because I just think it's a way to quantify it. Yes. Uh, we also, I agree, stock the parks with high pressure, let nature take care of the other areas. Uh, I, I think supplemental stocking has to happen in places where it just gets the snot pounded out of it because if you want the fishies to be consistent. And again, supplemental stocking, if you've listened to any literature on the Texas Department of Wildlife Resources, I think they're like the pinnacle there is supplemental just to make sure that the lows aren't too low and it kind of just levels it mm-hmm. out there because you do need natural, you need natural spawn classes. Uh, I just think rivers are more susceptible. With everyone we've talked to, when you have these major blowouts mm-hmm. every spring at the worst time possible, mm-hmm. I mean, if you get two years in a row, which we saw, I think right. it was like 2017, 18, I think it was, it kills two years of spawn class. And mm-hmm. ha- the, the lagging effect there, which mm-hmm. that's what the upper Potomac, that was the issue, is that's what they're just coming back from, not even what happened mm-hmm. on the Shenandoah. And it's different than a lake. It, it is, or tidal, where they can absorb so much water and it doesn't ruin, you know, three or four years of fishing because mm-hmm. you just killed the spawn. Mm-hmm. Now, our, I mean, our, our Shenandoah River smallmouth from 2007 to 2015, took hits every two to three years. Yep. Mm. Big hits. Yeah, mm. major. And honestly, by in 2016, 2017, 18, I very rarely took clients on the Shenandoah. That's right. <laughs> wow. It wasn't it, worth it. It was bad because we were talking about this earlier too. Like, uh, not only were you not catching, like, usually you at least see fish darting. It was like a dead sea. Like yeah. they weren't there. They there was were, no fish there. They weren't sad. there. You weren't catching you young fishing. fish. Yeah. You weren't catching old fish. Yeah. But, but it's rebound. We've seen a, re, a, yeah. a tremendous rebound and mm-hmm. we have very successful days on the Shenandoah, mm-hmm. the South Fork of Shenandoah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't get to go because of working all the time. I don't get to go and fish Front Royal or, mm-hmm. you know, places like that very often. It's been a couple years since I've even been down there. But Overall, the South Fork of the Shenandoah has rebounded tremendously, and we are having very successful days. Everyone we talk to is having successful days, you know, and and we're seeing recreational anglers out there in their kayaks and singles and doubles, and we're seeing other guides. You know, we're seeing bank fishermen. Everybody's doing well, and everybody's pretty happy with it, and everybody is releasing those smallmouth. and smallmouth are a little more durable to catch and release than mm-hmm. trout are. Right. So even in a perfect situation in the South River, catch and release for two and a half miles, we lose fish to bad handling. Yeah. We lose fish to predators. Without that supplemental stocking and the state stocking, mm-hmm. we would have very low trout numbers in town. Mm-hmm. What, are all trout species considered equal when it comes to catch and release versus put and take? As a kid that grew up w- w- with a lot of of put and take it's always been rainbows but when i look at the brookies and the browns is it is it culturally normal that you you basically will consume all three or is there ones like well if i catch a brookie that's more of something that's sacred to like put back there's becoming more of an ethic around the the native brook trout but i can tell you as a kid i grew up on a brook native brook trout stream it was 50 yards from my bedroom window wow that's cool um the uh, the older generation of hard scrabble Appalachia, my grandparents' generation, that were living hand to mouth for the most part, um, they ate those brook trout every chance they got, um, and they were considered a delicacy. Mm. Um, and that mentality does still exist because the grandparent tells the grandchild Col- these brook yeah. trout are delicious. Well, that grandchild at some point in their life is going to want to eat a brook trout. Um, you know, so that mentality is still out there, but there's becoming more of an ethic around let's protect this native species that only exists in this little window and has been here since the last ice age. Mm-hmm. It's been here 30, 40,000 years. <laughs> wow. That's insane. Um, so there is a growing ethic of, you know, really protecting them. Um, but as, as far as one being more durable than the other, they're all kind of susceptible to bad handling, get their slime off of them. It makes them susceptible. Same with smallmouth. Yeah. Right? Yep. Um, you know, don't wet your hands and grab a few smallmouth around the tail. You're going to leave marks on those tails. Mm-hmm. You're going to see some fungus. Um, hmm. You know, that 
that's going to happen with any fish species, but trout are a little more susceptible to bad handling, to being deprived of oxygen longer, held up longer for fixtures, that kind of thing. You know, generally speaking, 20, 30 seconds on a trout, you're starting to damage their lungs. Mm -hmm. Damn. Wow. That's why a lot of times you see in the nets and the videos and stuff, they'll leave them in the water. Everything's That's done kind of down in the water. That's become a much better, so, you know, yeah. and, and we've got better cameras nowadays. Mm -hmm. We've got, you know, everybody's got a good camera in their cell phone nowadays. So yeah. you don't need to keep that fish out of water to get mm -hmm. a good picture. Um, so, yeah, we, trout are a little more susceptible because of the way they breathe. The way they get oxygen mm -hmm. is through pressure on their gills. So trout are always facing in the current. If they live in a lake, they're always swimming. Huh. A trout can't hold stationary without water being pushed through its gills. Interesting, mm. interesting, interesting. So, and that's the whole trout family. So, you know, moving water, cold water, well oxygenated water, mm -hmm. and the cooler water is, the more oxygenated it is, mm -hmm. um, is paramount for trout. It's not paramount for a smallmouth. It's not paramount for a largemouth or a bluegill or a rock bass mm -hmm. or even a walleye. Right. They absorb oxygen from the water much differently. Hmm. Um, and so the, the trout is the most susceptible. It's the one we probably, we all, I, I love smallmouth. You know, I'm, a tra I'm born and raised trout fisherman, grew up on them, but I love smallmouth. Hmm. I'm not as worried about smallmouth as I am about trout. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I just I love when you get all these because like and Jared, you know, I've said this once or twice about the different tribes because yeah. you know, as a show that's really covering a state, it's just a single thing, and you realize each tribe has their own passionate thing, and right. you, you see this with musky anglers too, where like they're so protective of making sure each fish is taken care right. of, and they yell at each other and get in fights. So it's like if you're trying to catch a musky in the summertime, they'll try to kill each other. Yeah, like very passionate people this fish alive. And so it's interesting when you get down here and it's like we hear up at our end of the Shenandoah about yes. the smallmouth and then yes. down here it's like what about the trout yeah. situation and it shows that this company basically screwed everybody over yeah. with, with what happened. Um, I, I know that you have a booth and I really don't keep you much longer but I mentioned the muskie because you know Halliker and there's been a big push to, to put Shenandoah on the map. Do you see the muskie population down this far? If so, oh, absolutely. Is, is it good for business? Is it bad for business with the trout? What, what has it done for you guys? The Musky fishermen are very dedicated fishermen. Yeah. Um, they'll definitely challenge a trout fisherman as, as dedicated. Mm -hmm. um, there's a decent population of musky in the South Fork of the Shenandoah. Uh, we occasionally catch one as a bycatch. We occasionally go out for a fun day just to say, oh, we beat ourselves up and didn't catch a musky today <laughs> and go musky fishing. Um, but it's not our passion. Right. Um, we do have, because of fly fishing, there's also that layer of fly tying. And so I make sure my fly tying department has stuff That's for it. the musky guys. Um, you know, and, and they come to me because of that. Yeah. And so I get to hear the stories about, well, we had four follows yesterday. We actually had a hookup. <laughs> oh, we got two in the boat. I get to hear the stories and I get the excitement from it. I mean, it's a, I've caught one on a fly rod. It's incredible. It's, yeah. Um, it's a feat. It, it's, you know, it's, it's and, a feat. I mean, it's, and, and there's no reason not to have them there. They're, they're, they're not a bad thing for the river at all. They're coexisting. They are coexisting mm -hmm. fine with everything in the river. Um, far as we can tell, they've been there a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, the muskies have been in the Shenandoah for a long time. Um, you know, decades. And, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, but like based on what you said earlier about like, it's not our primary focus because of, of, of who your demographic is and who comes to you. Do you see, cause you're saying I have to carry the ties on for Muskie. Do you see maybe, does that change in the future? Do you think there's going to be a bigger sect of people going down? Cause I've interviewed guys where they have people flying in from the new river, the James river. Cause like Muskie's a thing. Do you think you're going to get more people that want guided trips or do you think it's always going to, going to be, the trout slash smallmouth people down here? I have people asking me for it. Okay. I generally recommend that they go to someone who is more focused on it mm -hmm. because 
the more you know about musky, the better your odds of putting right. a client on. Gotcha, That's gotcha, right. gotcha. If you're not, if you're taking clients out there as a random chance at, shoot, at catching a musky and mm. charging them for a musky trip, that's bad business. Right, makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to put that out there because I like them. They're cool fish. Wouldn't mind catching a few more. I'm not going to spend the. I don't have the time to spend mm -hmm. with my other, you know, pursuits to get the knowledge base to guide someone from us. What is your client breakdown for guides when you just compare smallmouth to trout? What does that look like? It's grown on the smallmouth side to where it's probably mm -hmm. more of about 40% smallmouth, 60% trout. Gotcha. Maybe not quite right. that, but it's close to that. When we first opened, it was 80% trout, 90% trout. Interesting. Yeah. Because we're on a trout stream. Oh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, right. yeah. You know, and, and we were a new business, you know, 12, 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Even that, though we had a lot of experience on that river before we opened the shop, right. we were new. That's right. got to be good for the diversifying stuff. But any, anyway, guys, um, so I, I want to make sure that we don't keep you for six hours here. Yeah. Um, I can, I'm pretty good at talking forever. <laughs> um, for people that are listening, and then this will be re-uploaded in a couple of weeks as a podcast episode to Apple, Spotify, and iTunes, where can people find you and how can they get a hold of you if they want to book a guide trip? So we're uh, downtown Waynesboro, Virginia, uh, South River Fly Shop, um, southriverflyshop.com. Um, we also have a uh, Facebook page with Messenger, Instagram page, uh, South River Fly Shop on both of the above. Um, that's all linked. Um, so reach out to us, give us a call, stop by the shop, fully stocked fly fishing shop. Uh, we don't do anything else. Um, you know, rods, reels, flies, fly lines, fly tying. That's what we do. Um, and the, the guide service, we have, you know, three boats available for smallmouth pretty much all the time. We're working on a fourth one. Um, we have uh, four guides available for trout as well. Um, so, and we do everything from the Shandola National Park to the George Washington National Forest to the South River and its tributaries. It's pretty amazing too. Mm -hmm. We were talking all with like we just first met down here, but um, had a common person in Ryan Feehan. Like yes. Ryan's been to Jake's. Ryan fish for Virginia Tech. He's helped us with our youth program, Frederick County Bass. And when you were talking, I got to thinking about the video that he did for your fly shop which was a phenomenal job. And then when I said, well, who was it? And he said, Ryan Feehan. I said, I know Ryan, like it's such a small world. It is. And, uh, you know, well, we're took, not too far from home, but we got a lot of connections. I took Ryan and his brother, Justin out. And we went, we went with the intention of beating ourselves up on September the 30th or October the 1st. After it had cooled down, we went with the intention of beating ourselves up and trying to catch a muskie mm -hmm. on the Shenandoah. And Ryan got it done. Did he? Wow. Um, that's cool. We got a nice muskie on conventional gear. That's awesome. We had four follows on the fly. Um, but uh, Ryan got a nice high 30s muskie on, awesome. on conventional that day. That's good wow. stuff. Um, and we caught some nice smallmouth too. I mean, we weren't going to beat ourselves up that bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. We cool. didn't just pound muskie all day. Yeah. Um, we caught some nice smallmouth that day as well. But yeah, the. The community is mm -hmm. very diverse. Yes. And that there we have more in common than we have in difference. Right. Yes, I That's agree right. with that. Especially comes to the the bodies yeah. of water. When, yeah. when it comes to the fish we all love, yeah, we all have our favorite. But at the end of the day, we all like being out there. Yep. Yep. So and quote Thomas. That, that's a closing that thought right there. Love that's it. a closing <laughs> thought right there. Guys, like and subscribe to the channel. We're gonna take a we're gonna take a quick 15, 20 minute break, then we're gonna come with our closing thoughts. Again, thank you so much. Uh please join uh please check him out. We'll have all the episode descriptions linked in the episode when we re-upload it. We we'll guys see you guys in a minute. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Aarons. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.